Welcome everyone, I'm Dick Deming. I'm Medical Director of Mercy One Cancer Center and the founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our weekly cancer education series. It's brought to you in part by a grant from the Rosalie and Sherry Exline Ziegler Fund. And tonight you're in for a treat and so am I. I got my friend here, Henny O'Carrion. Dr. Carrion is the Chief Medical Executive for Mercy One. He's also the COO for our hospital and he's an emergency room physician. How do you do all that? <laughs> very carefully, <laughs> Dick, very carefully. So, but thank you for that introduction and, and such an honor to be here and share the stage with you. So thank you for this opportunity. I have a few minutes to talk to you and engage the audience that might be out there. Well, super. And uh, Henny and I also got to know each other quite well this summer. So uh, Dr. Carrion and his daughter, Lily, were on the Above and Beyond Cancer team that summited Mount Kilimanjaro this June. Yeah, quite an experience. I think we're still both recovering. So, <laughs> and Lily's getting ready to go off to school. I actually, dropped her off this past weekend. So um, she's excited and uh, really happy for her to start her journey down uh, college. So great. It was, it was uh, a little bit of an emotional ride as a dad. So, so uh, Lily um, is 18, had just graduated from high school, Correct. and was the youngest member of our team. The oldest was 72. And I have to tell you, having an emergency room physician on your climbing team is like a, a godsend. <laughs> well, thank you for that. So. I really appreciate it. It was really rewarding for me, not only to be present, to be able to su support the individuals that were there, but really it was a, a pretty emotional experience for both me and Lily. And really thank you for allowing us to participate. Well, it was great having both of you on. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So where did you grow up and where did so, you go to? I grew up in a small town in Illinois. My parents had immigrated uh, from Mexico uh, in the early 70s, so uh, was the last. And uh, I'm assured that I wasn't an accident, although uh, it feels that way when my next oldest is about 12 years uh, older than I am or my next youngest. Um, but family of six, uh, brothers and sisters, a very close-knit family, small town of about 10,500 in Illinois, about an hour, hour and a half outside of Chicago. So, so um, you're the baby of six kids. <laughs> the baby okay. of six. And your oldest sibling was how much older than you? 18 years older than okay. I was. Okay. So uh, I had six or five dads as, or moms and dads is what I said yeah. uh, growing up. So everybody was uh, very observant of me as a, as the small one. So. And then where'd you go to college? I went to Drake University. So go Bulldogs. Uh, spent uh, 95 to 99 uh, there and met my wife, uh, Shanda, who uh, transferred actually to Grandview and enrolled in their nursing program. So graduated from Drake University uh, as Shanda was finishing up her nursing program, enrolled at Des Moines University for medical school uh, training. And uh, during our medical school rotations, traveled the country, went to Arizona, Michigan, uh, Chicago, uh, a big percentage of it, and then uh, did a year internship out uh, at St. Barnabas in New York, and then finished up my uh, residency at OSF in Illinois. So my- And that uh, residency was in emergency medicine. medicine. Yeah, correct. So a couple questions. When did you know you wanted to be a doctor? At what point in your uh, education? High school or college? So it was actually third grade. Oh. Uh, so it was pretty young. Wow. Uh, yeah, I uh, so was asked to write a paper on what I wanted to do when I was older. So. Uh, I grew up with a brother who had some chronic health conditions and unfortunately uh, died when he was uh, uh, 14 years old. So um, really had a profound impact on my life and even at that age had kind of committed myself that I was going to be a physician. And really the, the question was going to be the how and when. Okay. And then at what point did you decide it was going to be emergency medicine? So ironically, as a uh, student uh, at Drake, there was a lot of um, different opportunities and encouragement from our faculty to get involved in the community. So um, I took a EMT class uh, and got the opportunity to ride along here in the Des Moines Metro with several of our EMS colleagues um, and then loved it, fell in love with it, really enjoyed it, actually was volunteering at the time at Methodist 
uh, in their emergency department as well and uh, became a patient care tech at Mercy One in 1998. So I've been part of Mercy One in some capacity for about 25 years, uh, other than my experience when I left for my residency and training, and uh, subsequently became a patient care tech in the emergency room. So for whatever reason, all the stars aligned, mm -hmm. I had to convince myself during uh, residency or when I was making the decision in medical school about my residency that I wasn't gonna do emergency medicine. Like, you know, I'm, I have to look at every other specialty, make sure this is the right one for me. Um, and did oncology as my second rotation, hematology, oncology, loved it. Did critical care as my third rotation, loved critical care. Uh, did obstetrics next, loved obstetrics, did general surgery, loved general <laughs> surgery. I thought this is amazing. And then as I was reconciling what specialty I want to go to, what is the specialty that's going to give me that wide variety, the acuity uh, that I want to see and the impact that I want to have on patients and families. And it was emergency medicine. And, okay. you know, sat down with the board, did the pros and cons, and it just 100% was ER. So it sounds like it wasn't, um, okay, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I just want that, <laughs> that excitement. It was uh, much more... Uh, thoughtful than that. Yes, I, I would, I would say so. Okay. Um, so, um, as you know, most of our audience is, uh, tuned in or here live, uh, because they have a connection to cancer. Um, so it's not completely obvious what's the connection between emergency medicine and cancer, but there's lots of connections between emergency medicine and, and pretty much any disease process. I thought maybe we would explore what some of those intersections are and um, and then talk about what is the role of an emergency room in a cancer patient's journey? Um, when is it um, appropriate and or necessary for that interaction? And when does it sometimes just interact? So for example, I'm you know well aware that somebody might show up at the emergency room with just really severe, back pain that incapacitates them and they came in because they're hurting and in the emergency room they get a scan and lo and behold you see findings on the scan that looks like cancer that's causing their pain because it's metastasized to the spine so i mean a story something like that where someone who doesn't know they have cancer comes into the emergency room with symptoms and it's the emergency room physician who is the first doctor to recognize they may have widespread cancer. I mean, has that happened to you? Unfortunately, that happens with a degree of frequency. And I, I don't think as, as despite as often as we encounter it, that it ever gets easy to have that conversation with the patient. Because unlike going to an oncologist or unlike going to a scheduled visit where you may have established rapport with a clinician, you don't get to choose your emergency room doctor. Sometimes there's a good chance that you didn't even choose the location. It just happened to be this abrupt pain when you're out of town or visiting family members or whatever it may be. So you may not even be in a familiar setting and you're having this conversation with what appears to be a complete stranger about a diagnosis that is changing your life as you as you share those words and we know even in the clinic setting where it's more controlled not as chaotic as the emergency department when individuals hear that term cancer everything else starts to become a little bit more oblivious so ensuring that they have that appropriate support even following the conversation becomes important but to your question yes we have it yes those are very challenging um, at times and the unfortunate reality is as much depending on the diagnosis, not everything gets done in the emergency department. And so it really becomes very important to, to establish that next step, what's going to happen mm -hmm. next. Because I think um, patients, as much as they value establishing the diagnosis, are equally as concerned as well, what now, well, what do I need to do? And the unfortunate reality is sometimes this is happening at 1 a.m. on a Friday morning. And so it may not be until Monday or Tuesday that they're going to be seen by their clinician. So providing degrees of reassurance, depending mm -hmm. on the diagnosis, depending on the condition, if it's something very significant where they may need emergent 
therapies, then, you know, we're having the conversation, hey, you're going to have to come in the hospital. We're going to call multiple physicians to make them aware of what's happening. They're going to get involved in your care. What else can we provide you in the short term? Can I call your family? Can I call someone else in so that they're there and they can mm -hmm. be supportive? Um, but it's a, it's a very difficult conversation and it's um, extremely dependent on the situation and setting and the time of day, what, what options you have. And, and who they have with set. them at the time. Exactly. Yeah. It seems like it, it's almost uh, would be an easier conversation if their situation was such that you knew that they needed to come in and be an inpatient. There it's sort of like, okay, here's what we think is going on. We're going right. to admit you and then we're going to bring in the experts. And there's sort of this understanding that there will be further conversations about this as you get into your hospital room and we bring everyone else on board. If their symptoms aren't severe enough, they need to stay in the hospital and then you're going to be discharging them home, then it would seem like the responsibility of having a even more significant conversation before sending them home is, is on your shoulders. And I think that is... Um... A very difficult conversation within itself because there is at times the belief that why well, came in the emergency department why is everything not being done then expeditiously from this point forward and so it is developing a little bit of a, of a trust with the patient to say yes your condition is urgent that you do need to see someone in close follow-up but there's nothing that's going to happen between today and that follow-up that's going to change uh, your prognosis or condition, but here's the things that we're going to do in the short term to provide you that degree of reassurance. Um, but that can be a challenging conversation because, again, you're hearing this diagnosis for what you know and what Google may tell you, you're feeling your prognosis may be more terminal than it actually is. Mm -hmm. And so having that conversation becomes difficult. The, some of the other challenges at times that can occur are individuals that actually have gone to their primary physicians or other clinicians and, um, you know, their symptoms were very mild and lo and behold, it was something more significant. And in the defense of the clinicians, it's that um, manifestation of illness that didn't present at the outset, but because now they become more chronic and you're kind of questioning, okay, help me understand. And what, what are the other symptoms that you're facing that make you go down a path of further diagnostics that not to the, to the fault of any of the clinicians that have probably done a great job in their assessment, but just hadn't now progressed six months later, have the associated weight loss or other symptomology that really triggers you to think mm -hmm. there, there's something more significant going on here. So um, you've shared with me a bit about your life experiences and um, would you feel comfortable talking about um, maybe how you first, um, when you first encountered cancer in your in your family, sure. Um, and I know we we shared this on on the trip to Kilimanjaro, which was uh, life changing in itself because of the individuals that were able to participate in that journey. And I, I really made a um, concerted effort to try to learn everyone's journey that had experienced cancer. And there were individuals on that trip that were married couples and hear their experience together of you know, what, you know, the spouse that didn't have cancer felt about the spouse that was diagnosed for me was very moving just to, to hear their journey. But, um, my first experience was with my father. Um, actually, um, I happened to be home for, uh, from Michigan was planning to travel to Arizona when his urologist called us on, on uh, the day before Christmas Eve to let us know that, uh, he had been diagnosed with an aggressive prostate cancer. How old were you? Uh, at the time, I was, I believe, 25. So you were in medical school? I was in medical in school. In medical school at the time. I um, was a fourth-year medical student. Mm -hmm. So dangerous enough to know, but mm -hmm. still not informed enough to, to really mm -hmm. kind of understand maybe the magnitude uh, of the diagnosis at that and, juncture. And did your dad tell you? Did your mom tell you? Did you? The urologist the told me. The doctor called you. Yeah. The young, budding doctor. Yes. Uh, and we spoke on the phone. My, my father's English wasn't the greatest, so I acted as the, the translator uh, for him. So as, as a son, hearing the diagnosis and having to tell your father uh, was, was difficult to do. Um, so obviously you have all the questions as far as what are next steps, when can he be seen, when can we start kind of therapies and those things. And um, for the most part, everything seemed to be managing okay. Uh, I got the call probably my, so January of my first year of residency, we're in New York, uh, your father's condition, 
uh, is terminal. There is no further therapies that can be left. Uh, and, you know, we don't know what his longevity is going to be. So I made the decision at that time uh, that I would leave my residency uh, and um, see what would happen. I, I don't know what was going to happen, but I was going to be close to my father. So relocated uh, to my hometown, had the opportunity to live with my mom and dad for the next six months with my spouse and first child as well. Um, and then went through the match again and was fortunate to match an hour away from home. So that worked out very well in emergency medicine. And at the time, emergency medicine was extremely competitive. So I was very grateful um, that it worked out. Uh, and ironically, um, St. Francis, where I trained, uh, which was also a Catholic ministry, uh, was where my, my brother went all the time. So it was a little bit of a you know, mm -hmm. full circle of coming back. And when the sister I encountered her for the first time when I walked into that institution and she says to me, you're not here because of an accident. You're here. It, it really resonated mm -hmm. with me, even though right. I've, I've heard the statement over and over right. again. Um, it really was very profound for me that I really did feel like it wasn't an accident. Um, and then uh, several months later, uh, my father passed away um, from that. And I was able to leave residency, go home, uh, take him from the hospital. And he, uh, he was, uh, was able to pass away in front of his whole family wow. so it was uh yeah for you to leave uh, take a leave of absence from your training to be able to to go home and then to be able to be with your family for that six months it was an incredible act of courage and compassion and uh i can tell from the way you tell it that it also ended up being a rewarding experience for you it, it was it, it very much was and i think it added to uh, the journey with Lily. So Lily had been born uh, two months prior to his death. And so uh, four weeks uh, prior to that, he actually came and planted some tulips in our home in uh, Peoria. And so those tulips still every once in a while, I'll go and I'll see them um, budding. And it's that constant reminder that, you know, four weeks prior to that, he was, you know, planting tulips mm -hmm. and he saw Lily. You know, and so when we hit the peak of Kilimanjaro, that was what was in my mind to be able to experience that with um, someone and knowing that I was carrying my dad's prayer flag, which I wish I would have brought, um, was really, really something, an experience that I, I can't replicate. Yeah, that was a beautiful experience we had. And um, so your father died of cancer during your residency. My mom died of cancer during my medical school, my second year of medical school. So we kind of have that shared bond as well. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, let's kind of shift gears again and go back to the emergency department. Um, so w when did it change from ER to ED? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good, that's a good So, uh, so back in my days, so it's always ER and ED meant something different. Um, so in the, in the world of medicine, ED also stands for, besides emergency department, it stands for erectile dysfunction. But, 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 but officially, at some point, I've been a doctor for 43 years, at some point, ERs changed to EDs. When, yes. when did that happen? So I'm going to say it was probably 2010. There was a big push that we are not a room. We're not a room. We're not I a room. See. We're a department we of the department. hospital. Department. And so gotcha. we really pushed to, to, to change that, ED, change that nomenclature. ER. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, cause everybody remembers the, the TV show TV ER, show, right. so yeah. really difficult to make that yeah. move. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so we talked about, uh, patients who come in who don't know they have cancer and that the, the emergency room doctor and emergency medicine physician may end up being the one who has to have that conversation with the patient and the family. Um, let's talk a little bit more about just a, as an emergency room physician, wh where do you see other interactions with cancer patients in the emergency department? And maybe what are some words of wisdom for patients? Um, and especially, you know, most patients going through chemotherapy know that they're immunosuppressed and they might be exposing themselves to all sorts of germs and, and um, uh, are, are advised, don't go anywhere where you might be around germs. And then they're feeling some symptoms uh, that they're, uh, are severe and first inclination is, you know, it's a weekend, it's night, I got to go to the emergency room. Uh, maybe just talk a little bit about 
how you see the role of the emergency room in taking care of patients who are undergoing cancer treatment or are having uh, medical issues. So there's a lot to unpack in your yeah, question yeah. there. So um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of statistics that may stagger you a little bit, but also I think is important to the conversation. And so from 2012 to 2019, the amount of cancer visits that um, went through the emergency department increased by 67%. So they constitute a little over 4% of visits that occur to the emergency department are related to cancer-related conditions. So individuals that already have the diagnosis of cancer but come in with associated symptoms. Then to your point, the pandemic hits, and we do a magnificent job of keeping these individuals with chronic health conditions out of the emergency room. We do everything we can because we don't want to expose them to this uh, condition that's communicable. Um, because we don't know how they're going to respond depending on how immunosuppressed they are. And then post-pandemic, we start to experience the workforce issues that we're experiencing. So some of the progress that we have made is starting to regress to a degree because of those challenges. But that being said, I think what we did very effectively during the pandemic was make sure that you're going to the location of care that is best suited for you. The emergency department is open 24 by 7, 365. We're happy to care for any individual that comes in for any health condition. But to your point, we also want to ensure that our patients are going to be appropriately managed and that they are seeking the level of care that's needed. We know urgent cares exist. We work very closely with our urgent cares so that if there is something they can't manage or the patient's condition is far worse that they know they can call us and let us know and we'll take those patients over into our emergency department to have the appropriate care that they need. So sometimes that's that's a good uh, barometer. Other times establishing care with your primary care or local oncologist and having that discussion as far as, hey, this is what I'm feeling. What are your thoughts? Because they usually have someone who's on call or available to at least help facilitate, you know, yeah, you should go to the emergency room. This sounds pretty sick. Or, hey, come and see me in the office tomorrow. We'll get you in first thing in the morning. I think our clinicians try to do a good job of being somewhat accessible um, for our patients, especially uh, depending on where they are in their cancer journey. Mm -hmm. um, Let me I, ask you just to, and I don't mean to cut you off because I know you, you're can continuing to talk about this, but you mentioned urgent care. Maybe for those who don't know, can you dis distinguish what is an urgent care clinic and uh, what are the conditions that one should go to an urgent care clinic for? And how do you compare and contrast the emergency department to an urgent care clinic? So I, the easy way to think about it is if you're not sure if you're truly sick and that there's something eminent, i.e., it's not related to your breathing, it's not related to you feel like you're having a stroke or a heart attack, but you feel, I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe I have an upper respiratory infection, maybe I'm feeling moderately nauseated, um, but I'm not repetitively vomiting, or I've had a few episodes of diarrheal illness, um, but I'm concerned uh, given just the days of, of symptoms that I've suffered. Those are appropriate urgent care visits. Um, they can be appropriately managed and triaged and determined, you know what, you're actually sicker than you think, you need to go to the hospital, or here's appropriate therapies that you need to take, follow up with your doctor in short order if these symptoms continue or always return. When I think about the emergency department, I think life-threatening conditions are the, the ideal conditions that are going to come to an emergency department. You can't breathe, you need to be hospitalized, you're having acute stroke, you're having a blood clot in your legs or your lungs. Um, those are the conditions that warrant the emergency department visits. Okay. Now, th those are difficult sometimes for lay people to be mm -hmm. confident in. And I always say if you're uncertain and you think your condition warrants an emergency department visit, it, it is completely appropriate to go to the ER. But I also think there are conditions when someone knows, I don't feel that sick, but I just want to make sure those are appropriate conditions to go to your urgent care. Can you get lacerations sewn up in an, in an urgent care? Lacerations and most fractures that aren't um, completely distorted, uh, fractures that need to be reduced uh, can easily be managed in uh, urgent care setting. Okay. So 
I kind of interrupted your train of thought. You were talking about this continuum of patients, cancer patients that are under cancer treatment and are at home and are having symptoms and and they, they call their oncologist and they speak to the nurse practitioner and there's sort of a bit of a phone triaging, if you will, an assessment of, of uh, gosh, is this symptom such that we need to say this could be life-threatening, you need to go to the emergency room or can we just see you in the morning? or um, our oncologists at Mercy Cancer Center have a weekend clinic every Saturday morning, every Sunday morning for those patients that might um, need some fluids or might need to be seen, but want to avoid going to the emergency room because that might not be necessary and it might expose them to lots of other people in a crowded uh, situation. Correct, and I would definitely encourage utilizing those resources when able. Um, again, for the reasons that you mentioned, obviously we want to minimize the risk to patients because there is going to be communicable diseases that are there. Everyone who's experienced the emergency department knows that there's overcrowding that exists. So the experience isn't always the greatest. Um, so trying to minimize the delays that you would have in appropriate care um, is, is extremely important as well. Now, that being said, um, and hopefully it continues to improve, but um, when we were looking at what was progressing or leading to that such an increase in cancer patients coming to the emergency department, it was kind of related to novel therapies, uh, more outpatient therapies that were being provided. Yeah, some of the newer uh, treatments with weirder side effects and uh, side effects that the patients might not know intuitively were caused by the treatment. Correct. Individuals were more apt to travel to larger cancer centers and not necessarily establishing care with local oncologist or local mm -hmm. primary care being aware, hey, you're in a study drug, here's the potential side effects. And so that really creates a lot of difficulty uh, for the emergency department when you don't know what the drug is, you don't know what the potential side effects are, and you have maybe vague symptoms. And so you're kind of left uh, doing a quadri of different tests related to, okay, could it be an arrhythmia? Could it be a metabolic process um, that could be developing here? So um, having a degree of insight of you know what the potential side effects are of those study drugs are very important. Um, as well, and obviously we attempt to contact the oncologist regardless of where they're located, depending on the clinical conditions, of course. Um, but sometimes those individuals are also not available depending on what hours they function. So I, I always encourage individuals to make sure that they have established someone local that is very uh, confident and understanding of what treatment and therapies they are getting, if, especially if it's gonna be somewhere remote. Um, the other piece, which becomes very uncomfortable, especially again, when you're meeting a doctor for the first time that you didn't pick in a setting that's overcrowded and maybe slightly noisy is palliative care. Um, there is a large percentage of patients that come through the emergency department at end of life and may come back repetitively. And those are very challenging conversations to start um, with family members because sometimes um, palliative care can be associated with hospice, but it's not synonymous um, with hospice. But sometimes when you bring up palliative care early, that's the belief that you're you're advising them that their condition is terminal and that there's no other therapeutic options and they need to go through hospice. And it's, it, it's very different. It's a very different pathway of being conservative because the number one reason for cancer patients to come to the emergency department is related to pain. Over 40% of patients that present to the emergency department is related to pain. And being honest, we're probably one of the worst clinicians uh, to treat pain. We just, we know how to do acute pain, but we don't really know how to manage chronic pain effectively. And so I always think being, doing some of those therapies in conjunction with those that are experts, i.e. your oncologists or palliative care physicians really can enhance uh, the, the life of these individuals living with cancer. And I believe there's several studies out there that have actually shown that um, their quality of life is significantly improved under palliative care. Yes, and, um, and also uh, uh, less need to access emergency room, less need to access uh, healthcare in general, and lower in the costs of uh, healthcare when palliative care is part of the, the team from the beginning. So there's sort of this anticipation that, um, that 
the pain medicine regimen you're on is, is, is likely going to have to change over time and that it's not just this is the regimen and Correct. it allows for some escalation and usually there's much more communication and ease of, of uh, contact so that you can talk through those um, changes before the pain escalates to the point that you feel the need to go to the emergency department. Right. Yeah. Um, so what are some other interactions uh, that you might um, encounter in the emergency department with cancer patients? Um, I, I think I, I've seen, again, um, a variety of different conditions. I think sometimes the difficult ones, which I've been a part of, is when family haven't disclosed to the patient their diagnosis, whether it's because of maybe a cognitive impairment or something else, and, and now you're at the point of, um, do we continue to provide therapies? Do we not uh, do that? And again, depending on their cognition at the time, I always feel like that conversation needs to occur with, with the individual. So um, those are challenging conversations if the family feels differently that it shouldn't occur um, with the patient and attempting to take those into account. Um, the second is obviously as individuals uh, who are, are undergoing therapies they may decide at the time they don't want anything done and um, their condition could be extremely poor. And as you know, as clinicians, sometimes we feel a little bit of a failure if, if a bad outcome occurs, i.e. death arises. Um, and I think accepting and understanding that ultimately dying with dignity is okay. It's acceptable, but that, that I, I think part of my, um, journey post training is something that I've had to develop versus believing it's it's a failure if that's what a, a patient chooses. Yeah. And the emergency room is not the best place to die with dignity. Uh, I would agree. Yeah. And so obviously having conversations earlier on so that uh, patients that um, have uh, incurable cancer and as their condition worsens and they approach end of life, um, having hospice on board specifically with the goal of a peaceful death because we, we've all seen patients that they're, they're under treatment they kind of don't really understand necessarily that the treatment's not intended to eventually cure their cancer and if they're still at home and things worsen it's sort of 911 is a is an easier alternative than um at that point, trying to get hospice involved and trying to bring all the resources to bear to create this environment that's going to be a peaceful, uh, peaceful death. Yeah, um, I can think of some other situations where I've, you know, advised my patients to go to the emergency room. I want to be a seizure, first time seizure. I mean, that's a scary situation and usually uh, with a, a cancer patient requires a workup and it could be uh, a metastasis that's gone to the brain for the first time. Could be metabolic abnormality, but that's certainly something that uh, happens out of the blue sometimes to patients who have a history of cancer that would prompt an emergency room visit or um, bleeding, you know, whether yeah. it's from um, uh urine or from coughing up blood or rectal bleeding that becomes frighteningly uh, uh, abundant is, is, is cause for an emergency room visit. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think you, you reminded me sometimes individuals that have had cancer and now are cancer free um, and come in with a complaint that seems relatively benign. And when you start talking to them, like, why are you here? W what happened? And lo and behold, they'll, they'll share, well, I had cancer and I'm worried that there's recurrence. And, and sometimes just providing that reassurance to say, no, your, your symptoms are not related to your malignancy. Here's what we did to, to um, prove that's not the case right now um, and everything looks good. But also having an understanding of why they came to the emergency department, mm -hmm. even though right now they're cancer free. Um, I, I think individuals that now are living cancer free always have that underlying fear that could it recur? Could it come back? Could it now be something else? And so 
if you don't ask the right questions, sometimes you don't know how to provide them the appropriate reassurance that they need as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those first few years after you've been told, okay, treatment's done, you're cancer free, and um, every ache and pain for the first year, it's like, oh my gosh, it must be back. And so there's a high level of anxiety about symptoms on behalf of the, the patients that uh, need some soothing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what do you think about the just the way uh, we practice medicine in the United States? So, for example, the role of the primary care doctor. So, you know, I grew up in the day, you know, I was in a small town, so there were like two different primary care doctors, and you, you, you knew who your primary care doctor was, and, and um, uh, the ability to get in to see that doctor was pretty easy. Um, now, um, we've got, um, doctors that kind of join one group and switch and go to another group and combine and merge. And, um, I, you know, I've got patients who've had the, the same lawyer for 50 years, the same dentist for 30 years, the same account, but they change their doctor changes every six months. Uh, do you see that? that there's a tendency to not have these well-established relationships and that that leads to more turning to the emergency room rather than feeling like they've got a bond to a primary care doc? Oh, I absolutely do. I absolutely do. And, and again, it, not that they can't utilize the emergency department, but when you get to it, um, there are examples like that countless times, especially um, potentially during off hours where they feel like I can't necessarily call my physician tomorrow uh, because he doesn't work, you know, Thursdays and Fridays or she doesn't work, you know, Wednesday through Friday, whatever it may be because of modified schedules or they're at a different location that is more remote than they're able to travel creates a lot of um, concerns for the patient who may feel they need somewhat urgent uh, follow up. And so we do see plenty of those, to your point, individuals that may be working at multiple different clinics. So when you're trying to find them, and you can imagine as a clinician, it's tough. Can you imagine as a patient trying to find those mm -hmm. uh, physicians as well? So those, those create some challenges. And I think, again, we continue to look at ways to make it easier for the patient. Um, but we're still, I think, a long way away. And e even when we talk about the EMR, the ideal state would be every hospital, every clinic, anywhere you go, you're on one EMR. So we all have that same information because I know that also in itself can create a lot of concerns for right. patients. If we had all of the lab tests and x-ray results that the patient may have had, regardless of where they, they were seen, I have all of that in the electronic medical record. Okay, can you imagine how much time and effort we'd be saved in, in not repeating so many tests because you just don't can't find the results. Yeah, absolutely. Have you seen any um, any examples of patients that have interacted with like these national uh, telehealth docs where you just kind of go online and, and have an interaction and get a prescription and then their condition worsens and they come to the emergency room and their interaction with doctors has been all telehealth uh, via via the internet? Is that something that you're starting to see at all? So I'm not necessarily, I can't say that I've seen anybody who has the diagnosis of cancer or um, uh, significant concern for cancer. And probably not cancer. That yeah. question probably is unrelated to cancer. Yeah, but, but I have seen more and more patients that are um, just using the virtual options as their, as their primary care. And you know, don't really have a, a, a primary care physician that they would identify. They just call uh, this hotline. Obviously, more insurance carriers are providing that option for their consumers, and they're finding it very useful and, and taking advantage of the services uh, during off hours. So definitely seeing uh, more of that um, for certain. And, and again, to your point, the challenge of doing something virtual is, although it's beneficial, it's still limited. You only are going to get a certain... Um, amount of visibility and what they can ask and what they can do. And they'll always have the caveat of, but if you get worse, you know, mm. go, go, go X or CZ. Um, 
forward. And, and we have seen those individuals who have come in either inappropriately treated uh, with antibiotics or maybe even uh, in, inadvertently diagnosed with something incorrectly because of the limited abilities that you have virtually. Yeah, it's hard to get a really good look at the back of the throat uh, <laughs> the remotely or to feel the texture of a lymph node that might be enlarged. Correct. You know, how about uh, the role of AI in the emergency department? Oh, so that that has been a hot topic recently. Is is Chat GPT there uh -huh. or not? Right. Um, right. And can, can we it, just do away with used? the emergency room docs and just <laughs> just interact with Chat? GBT. GBT in the emergency <laughs> department? Not quite yet. So okay. I think the technology is uh, potentially has the opportunity to help individuals determine, should I go to the emergency department? Can I call mm -hmm. my primary care? Can I uh, use the urgent care? I think it, it has uh, some capabilities there, depending on the diagnosis and maybe symptoms that one is feeling to give you at least a little bit of guidance and maybe reassure what you're feeling. Like, do I think I need to go to the urgent care? I think that the AI is there to help, um, but um, it's still going to be more conservative, which I think is a good thing um, until we're a little bit more advanced state. Now, um, is it at a point where it should tell you what your diagnosis and condition is? No, mm -hmm. uh, not yet. And, and what about in the AI that's embedded in two electronic medical records to help prompt uh, what we would call the differential diagnosis? What, what are the possible diagnoses that this uh, set of symptoms, lab work, x-rays, um, you know, IBM Watson, there was a medical version of that at some point. I mean, I can't imagine that we're very far from having those embedded in the EMR to prompt uh, the physician with some uh, a, a list of differential possibilities. I think to your point, I think we're getting close to where we'll see some of that technology start to get embedded into the EMR. I do actually feel that there are certain health systems that have started to invest in those resources to help the clinician say, do I need to consider this advanced imaging or do I not? need to consider this advanced imaging because based off the uh, the diagnosis that are listed or the symptoms that are listed, the likelihood of having this condition is X percent and maybe you don't need the imaging to be done. Um, could I see that in the next five to 10 years? I do. Yeah. I, I yeah. could see that. And again, it, it's all done to augment the clinician. It's not to replace the physician, but really to augment their clinical decision making and try to minimize the likelihood of errors or omission. What are some myths or um, uh, preconceptions about emergency departments that uh, you would like to clarify for our audience? Um, so one is uh, that uh, we're overcrowded and that we won't take care of patients. Um, I think we do a phenomenal job of triaging patients that need to be um, appropriately treated and assessed and, and get them the care that they need, regardless of uh, the number of patients that may be waiting to be seen. Um, the second is that the, the clinicians don't care. Um, I, I would say, uh, having been an emergency room physician and work very closely with them, they are some of the most caring physicians uh, in the hospital. Uh, not that anyone is not caring, but um, they may not show their emotions at the time because we have to compartmentalize a lot of things that we're seeing in the moment. We could have gone from a death of a child in one room and then gone to someone with a sore throat in the second room. And we are very limited in our ability to carry those emotions through each encounter. So we have to compartmentalize that encounter and move forward uh, to that situation. But after the shift is over or after a period of time, there is a lot of self-reflection about those encounters, and these individuals are are very caring individuals for every encounter. Um, we are deliberately not um, attempting to miss any conditions. Uh, when we do miss things, we do a lot of education uh, to try to prevent those recurrences from happening again to anyone. Um, because they do happen. It's, uh, we are all human and there's a potential for mistakes to occur, uh, but we try to put processes in place to, to minimize those mistakes from recurring. Um, and I do think we've moved from um, a situation where um, maybe there was a belief either that uh, uh, you're admitting patients um, 
that may not necessarily need to be admitted for some conditions that can be managed outpatient. I think we are understanding more that uh, what primary care and outpatient providers can manage on the outpatient and working with them to streamline that process. Because a, a lot of times our patients, even though I, I suggested that some are, are concerned with what happens next, they don't really want to stay in the hospital either if they don't have to. Mm -hmm. So if we can um, establish the appropriate next steps and get that line of care established, 95% of the time, if they are able to go home, they want to go home. One of the things that I've seen change in the 34 years I've been at Mercy is it it used to be common and easy that um, uh, uh, if I was seeing a patient or the medical oncologist was seeing one of their established patients in their clinic and their, their condition had deteriorated to the point they needed to be admitted, that they could just arrange for a direct admission to call the cancer floor, identify an empty room, and just take the patient over to the hospital room and get him tucked in. And now uh, that seems uh, almost impossible um, uh, with um, sort of the shortage of rooms and the, the way, just the way the flow works that, that patients that have already been identified that need to go into the hospital still have to go to the emergency room now to, you know, maybe appropriately get stabilized and everything. But I, I guess your comments about, is this a good thing the way that this has happened? Do you think that there's still an opportunity as things sort themselves out to have this direct admit process for patients that are ill? Um, uh, I, I know there's still direct admits that happen for people that are going to go in and have surgery that are, you know, perfectly fine, go in and get registered and go to the operating room and then get admitted and skip the emergency department. But for those patients that are sick, that, that idea of a direct admit, is that gone forever? Uh, I don't think it's gone forever. I th still think we're exploring um, in situations where a diagnosis has been established and we know what steps need to take uh, to be taken that we were able to appropriately uh, place those patients to your point, given the workforce limitations that everyone across the country is facing, it's definitely become more challenging. So we do need to be more critical. And I still think um, that is where uh, the emergency department plays its most vital role, right? Is if you've identified somebody that's sick that needs immediate intervention, we are always going to be able to provide that service, you know, immediate IV access, IV fluids, immediate stabilization until that bed can become available. Um, but to answer your question, I don't think it's gone. I think we just are going to continue to have to refine and look at that process to make sure that um, we're able to create the capacity that's needed to manage those patients. Because if we can avoid, and you mentioned it earlier about total cost of care, is if we can avoid that emergency department visit uh, and get those patients into the appropriate uh, location to get the appropriate care that's needed, that's the optimal outcome for those patients. How do you see the emergency department changing over the next decade or two? Well, um, you know, th this is um, something that's been since I've been involved in medicine is we want to decrease the amount of people that are coming into the emergency department and being admitted to the hospital in general, right? What we'd love to see happen is the role of the primary care doctor helping us with uh, preventative health conditions, um, with, you know, vaccines being much more robust and able to minimize certain conditions. And obviously we're seeing the HPV vaccine. So even being able to prevent certain cancers having more of those preventative discussions, preventative therapies to us is going to be essential. And so really leaving the emergency department for those life-threatening immediate conditions that need to be treated and those, what we would say, the walking well that is, are going to go home would minimally be seen in the emergency department. So potentially the volumes we all say 2019 was kind of the peak of emergency medicine. We were seeing all kinds of volume since the pandemic, although we've seen some return, it hasn't been as robust as it was uh, prior to the pandemic. And we're hopeful that that will actually continue to be the case. The individuals will continue to utilize their primary care providers, utilize other services of care um, and, and allow the emergency department to, to see those patients that are in more eminent need.
All right. Well, we got a few minutes. So let's open it up for questions. So we've got a live studio audience here. We also have a live uh, live streaming audience. So those of you who are watching us uh, virtually, if you have questions, you can just put the questions into the comment box. We're watching that. And we'll go ahead and open up to questions. Kevin. It, it, this is just observation. That I wouldn't go to the emergency room if I thought urgent care could, could take care of it. But a major factor in making that determination is what time what, what time of day is it yeah that's it that's a good point that's a big meaning. yeah and and we do um constantly evaluate um do we need to expand those hours because again if medicine in general has been pretty confined to business hours um and unfortunately that's not conducive for everyone not only when they get sick but also when they're not working and able to go to the doctor so do we need to be looking at uh, how we deliver healthcare and hence where virtual care has really started to to pick up is if if you knew it was your doctor on the other side of the of the um, screen, you would maybe more apt to reach out to them versus right now it's a virtual unknown. I don't know who it's going to be or the company or service that I'm going to get. Um, we, we believe that there would be more interest in, in having those services. So definitely something we're looking at. Okay. Yes, George. I've got an ER question I've been wanting to ask for decades. Oh, wow. All right. You mentioned the television show ER. <laughs> Those guys were always yelling for Lasix and ringers. <laughs> what What is Lasix and ringers? <laughs> <laughs> so I, obviously opposing medication. So Lasix is a diuretic that's going to make you urinate and get fluid off. And ringers are lactated ringers, so a solution that actually provides uh, volume to, to, to your system. So does, does the exact opposite. So one gets rid of fluids, the other one is fluids, and it's uh, used to kind of resuscitate you and bring you, bring you back if you're dehydrated, have blood loss, uh, would be kind of some of the indications. So for it. ringers is the bag of IV fluid. Oh. So that's that's calling for a bag of IV. Oh, food. I got you. Okay. Lactate. So if you want to be cool, you can definitely say, "Hand me the ringers." Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other question is more serious uh, now, and it has to do with the, the triage. I've been to the emergency room a number of times with someone else who needs to be seen, and it's a stressful circumstance, obviously. But you never know when you're waiting where you at are in line. I mean, it's not first come first serve, obviously. And if life light comes in and everything can go to that and how can you, is there a method or a plan to let people know where they are in line basically to, to be seen and might you be able at some point to kind of triage yourself online so you could know before you ever go to the emergency room that, yeah, you're going to be an hour being seen for that malady, whatever it might be. So th there's a lot of implications to it. So hospitals have done exactly what you said. They post online or post on a billboard that it could be an hour. Um, as you know, when you go to the emergency department, if a flight or an ambulance comes in, guess what? Might have been an hour. Now it's three hours, but you've, you've already perceived that. The, the challenge or, or the concern that we've always had with that sign is if you think you're having an emergency, I don't want that time frame to deter you from being seen in the hospital. Because if you have a heart attack and you say, you know what, I'm okay, the consequences are much more dire um, if you don't go to the emergency department. And the unfortunate reality is because we don't know what's going to walk in the door to tell you you're number three in line and you're going to go up next. It's going to change every time somebody walks in. You could be number three and now you're number 10, depending on just what walked in the door at that given moment. And I know minutes seem like hours in the emergency department hours seem like days uh when no one's kind of following up with you and we are working on ways to say can we go back and do kind of a retriage maybe the condition's gotten worse but also communicate to the patient here's here's where we are right now you know we're hopeful that you're going to get in because we again also understand the implications of you sitting in that waiting room are you leave and you go somewhere else or you leave and say you know what i'm going to go home and that's the last thing we want you to do especially if you have an emergent or urgent condition Poon. So we've got two emergency department at Mercy downtown and west. Is there a certain type of emergency situation where a patient should go west or just mainly downtown? So both facilities um, have emergency department physicians that staff their location 24 by 7. 
our main campus has a pediatric ED with um, uh, ED physicians that are trained and uh, or pediatricians by background that are there for pediatric conditions. Our main campus also is a level two trauma center. So we have a trauma center that's there and it is uh, um, thrombectomy capable. So if someone comes in with a stroke, they have the ability to do interventions immediately. Now, with all that being said, it doesn't mean that if you come into the West Des Moines campus and you're in need of any of those services, that we can't make that lateral move. But what we would say is if an ambulance or if someone knew, I think I'm worried about a stroke or I think I'm worried that my child has an acute condition, we would say your main campus is the preferred location to go. But again, if you showed up at our West Des Moines campus, they could provide stabilizing care till you could get to our main campus to be um, appropriately evaluated. But again, um, to your point, there are specialties and services that are provided in our main Des Moines campus that are not provided at West Des Moines. First, first of all, I want to thank you doctors tonight for a very fascinating conversation. I've learned a lot so far. But uh, one of my questions is, is that and you touched upon it a little bit. In an emergency room, you're always you know, going here and there, and you're thinking this compartment versus that compartment is a very stressful situation for you as a, a doctor and a stressful situation for the patient as well. But looking at the doctor side, how do you unwind after all this um, information is, is going throughout your whole day? One of the things for you to unwind, we've got a spin class in about 15 minutes, by the way, so <laughs> yeah. that's one good, good, good way, good way to it. do it. But how do you do it? How do you unwind? So um, I, as Dick alluded to, I think it was an evolution, became a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. So I uh, do like to do uh, adventures and hikes and biking and, and running and all the uh, things that do allow me to release some of that stress, increase the dopamine and just get into a good mental state. So it is um, being able to decompress in a healthy way is um, typically what I do um, and what we really encourage our other physicians to do as so, well. So Henny, uh, let's get specific. You just did a 12 hour shift. What do you do the first hour or two after um, that shift, a busy shift. I mean, so it, the life of an emergency department physician is um, difficult because we're shift workers. So it depends on the time of mm -hmm. day that you're getting off right. your shift. Sure. Right? So you could get off at 11 p.m. You could get off at 2 a.m. You could get off at 6 a.m. So it, it just depends yeah. on mm -hmm. when you're getting off what you're going to do. So let's assume I'm getting off at a 6 a.m. shift. It wouldn't be unusual to go for a run. You're just going to go unwind, get into that state, come home, have breakfast, go to bed, and then you're kind of back at it the next day um, as far as your next shift that goes. So, But it allows you that, that moment to decompress, kind of reflect on maybe the encounters or interactions that you had, um, and um, but allow you also to, to decompress more, more or less. Now, let's assume you're, you're getting off at 11 o'clock, you're exhausted. Um, how do you shut it off? Uh, usually you're hoping that you're that just that fatigued that, <laughs> that you're able to just go to bed mm -hmm. at that time. Um, are there points in time where, um, I've had to call a friend or vice versa? Absolutely. Maybe there's a really bad interaction that occurred. Um, I think one of the things that we've done, uh, very well within our group is be there for each other, uh, because we know those situations arise where you just need to talk through, the situation and encounter. And sometimes that is very therapeutic to be reassured that you did the right things, mm -hmm. uh, validated uh, to a degree that, no, that, that was completely appropriate. Because you might be questioning yourself after, mm -hmm. depending on what the outcome was. Yeah. Well, great. Well, this has been great. We're going to have to bring you back because we're out of time. Sorry we didn't get to all the questions. I just want to thank everyone that uh, participated. First of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Carrion, Henio Carrion, uh, Chief Medical Executive for Mercy One and an emergency department physician uh, and a friend. So thanks for being here. And uh, all of you watching, if you know someone that would uh, benefit by watching this program, it will be available on demand tomorrow at the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel and at the Mercy One Cancer Center website. And I hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I appreciate it.